so uh, well, let me first thank the organizers uh, to invitation for this uh, very exciting meeting, um, which is sort of uh, bringing me to the challenge to explain some of our very applied things, I mean material science things, to people that are mathematicians. They probably don't bother about materials at all. But anyway, um, I will try. So the title is Light Propagation in High Index Photonic Glasses. I will explain to you what, the, what I mean with that. And layered non-reciprocal media, media, I will also explain what I mean by non-reciprocity in light propagation, of course. And this work was sponsored by different agencies over a couple of years. And of course, there are quite a few people that have helped in doing these experiments and the materials. And the green people here are the chemists that were sort of synthesizing materials for us. Uh, the three students here and the two buses there. And the physicists are in blue. And uh, Christoph is now at the uh, University of Zurich. Um, and uh, Oliver was a bachelor student. And um, the work was basically done by Geoffroy, who is sitting here in the, with the red. Uh, Sweden and uh, his student Lukas Schertl. So, um, uh, of course, uh, I will sort of benefit from the talks of uh, Asi Genak and of Bart von Tickelen a lot, so I don't have to explain again uh, lots of things about globalization. But, of course, historically, Bart has given a very nice introduction into the history of, of this long standing 50 year more than 50 year old story. It was this famous paper by Phil Anderson. And what brought us into the game was sort of this 85 paper where he claims that, uh, let's say, the mechanism of Anderson localization would also work for white paints. And it would be easy. You know, uh, and he says, you know, in conclusion, I feel that localization in classical wave propagation is a phenomenon that should, in carefully prepared systems, be easy to observe and in such systems, the basic law of the localization phenomenon could be conveniently studied. For example, the critical exponent, blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, one point is carefully prepared system. And now I tell you, since 85, it's more than 30 years, we are trying to carefully prepare systems. <laughs> and yet, at the end, you might be disappointed. There's no clear evidence for un strong and localization in 3D with light yet. So it's not that easy, OK? So theoreticians sometimes make these long, you know, very nice, uh, easy predictions. But experimentalists behind have a hard time uh, doing this. Anyway, so Anderson was wrong on this point, OK? Now, um, it continues you know, in this 85. The relatively tricky example is high dielectric constant balls of particles embedded in vacuum air or low dielectric constant materials such as oil and so on and so on. White paint is composed of such a system. Here, the problem is one which we will encounter very severely in acoustical systems, namely that of an inhomogeneous <coughs> mixture of two propagating media. If the dielectric particles are in too intimate contact, meaning touching, more or less, we are in danger of developing a propagating slow wave which may localize more or less easily than the faster wave in the interstitials. We know that there's two types of coupled propagation that can occur at the same frequency. They must be localized and diffused together. I don't think that this is right. I will actually show you that it's wrong. Anyway, um, you know, this is a typical white paint, uh, the, the substance that makes the white paint really white, which is a powder of little colloidal particles where the size of the particles is roughly of the, wave, the wavelength of the light in, in question. And this is a commercial sample, a powder, white powder, which is mixed into all the white paints you buy in the supermarket. It contains above, uh, about 5%. And the rest is all this other junk, you know, that makes your paint, paint stick to the wall, that makes it, uh, I don't know, adhesive, that makes it you know, smooth and not, not um, brittle after a couple of years. And all these other things they add, which, of course, optically speaking, spoil the system. I mean, the background medium is not air. It's just another more or less high index mixed multi-component medium, which, of course, lowers the, the scattering uh, strengths of these materials. Anyway, so the basic is these colloidal uh, titania particles. And we can study, of course, the reflection, which should go ideally close to one. I mean, you want real white paint. 
uh, you know, every, all the light should be reflected, and then the transmission should be more or less zero in a thick, thick sample, in a thick sheet of paper. Anyway, now, um, Bart has, has given the history more in detail. This is only a few of these experimental citations on the efforts that have been made by different groups, the Dutch group, the, uh, the Italian group, and so on, and uh, with, with light. And I think if you're interested in the state of the art, why it doesn't really work, you, you should maybe read this paper of ours, where we have reanalyzed a lot of different papers, and, and uh, including our own, uh, saying that basically all the further belief, formally believed evidence for uh, experimental evidence for strong localization of visible light were not actually evidence, but some arti artifacts and artificial sort of uh, misinterpretations. Anyway, uh, back to Anderson's 85. He says, acoustic systems are probably harder to localize. Uh, you have seen already in this thing here, and um, uh, Bach has talked about this in detail, uh, this is very nice and, and, and strong evidence for localization, strong localization in an acoustic system. So it seems that acoustic systems easier localize than, than, than uh, optical systems, uh, in contrast to what, what Anderson says. Acoustic systems are probably harder to localize. One has few materials which simply do not propagate sound the way metals do not propagate electromagnetic wave. And there is a tendency for rigid bodies to be of higher and lower velocity, hence the framework wave is the fast one. The expanded silica gels might be interesting, blah, blah, blah. With sufficient contrast in velocity, high velocity framework, and soft interstitial materials, it could be that localization of the slow wave should be studied uh, meaningfully, treating the coupling of the framework as a weak coupling. No, the, what, what Bart has shown you, the, the wave propagates in the high speed material in the metal, and it's, it's it's sort of coupling the metal spheres together. The sound percolates sort of through the through the beats, and the low, the slow material doesn't have any influence at all. It's just air or fluid, which doesn't play any role in these experiments by basically by John Page and, and students. Anyway, so um, of course you have heard this morning another talk uh, on cold atoms and localization effects there. And which Anderson didn't have on his radar screen. I mean, not at all, right? <laughs> so, fine, OK. I, I'm not trying to destroy Anderson. I'm just trying to <laughs> say in this introduction that you know it's so easy for theoreticians to do these hand-waving predictions. And then it's so hard for experimentalists to realize the system. And, and, and the things go off in very, very different directions. Anyway, the last point. Uh, he says, one serious problem is that many of the discussions have emphasized one-dimensional systems, fine, one-dimensional localization should always happen, right? Which do not exhibit truly delocalized extended wave behavior, so that the clear physical distinction, he means between localized and non-localized uh, parts, is not possible. No, this is also wrong. I will show you in the end of this talk that we do have a means using the Faraday effect that breaks reciprocity of light propagation uh, to distinguish between the two. I will not explain you at this point, but later in the talk uh, how all this works. OK, so this um, sort of brings me to the menu. I will briefly go through photon diffusion and on this localization just for, uh, to, to set the language we are using and to define the quantities that, that we are sort of uh, talking about afterwards. And then I will talk in the first part of the, about these tunable calibrated photonic glasses, how they are made and how they are characterized, compare them with the scattering model. And then in the second part, I will do this quasi 1D and 1D sample description where we have localization and reciprocity breaking. And again, uh, we have some quantitative uh, information on uh, how the light propagates and this uh, can be compared with numerical simulations. Anyway, so this is all sort of basic, right? I mean, you imagine a, a, a big sample, I mean, a heavily scattering sample with, where these little particles have a high index and the blue stuff is low index material. So a glass of milk would do or a cloud, uh, droplets in the air would do if the, if the cloud is big enough. 
and then you shine the light in, the sunlight eventually from this side, and you are interested in the light in transmission and reflection. And if the cloud is thick enough, of course, you can see the sun through the cloud. So, which means that the direct beam which in incident from the left here is sort of damped out, very, very weak, exponentially small, while all the light you see is this diffusive light which has been scattered many times, both in reflection and in transmission. Okay, so, and more quantitatively, um, the direct light, which is the incident intensity I0, sort of exponentially dies out with, with, this, with the thickness, and there's a, a length scale here which, is, which we call the scattering mean free class. So it's just the length at which the uh, sort of intensity has been down by to 1 over e, and it's connected to the number density of the particles, of course, and the cross section of the particles. I mean, uh, how much uh, is the light scattered, or what's the probability of being scattered at any angle sort of uh, by a given particle? This is sigma s. And the sigma s can be calculated very easily by summing up the intensity scattered at any scattering angle. I mean, you imagine I come in with, at this point here, I come in from here with this in, the, in that direction, and then this angle here defines the scattering angle, and I can, can calculate or measure sort of the intensity as a function of this angle, and then I sum over all angles. That gives me this sort of cross-section uh, for the scattering, right? Okay, and this thing the optics people call the form factor, which is not, nothing but the angular uh, dependent intensity. Now, um, the multiply scattered light actually brings into another length scale, which is not necessarily the same, often it's of the same order of magnitude, but usually it's bigger, which is the main quantity I'm going to discuss throughout the talk, which we call L star, the transport mean free pass. And the transport mean free pass sort of is, is the, the, the corresponding cross-section is sort of given here, I mean sigma star compared to sigma, just contains this 1 minus cosine theta s, meaning uh, this is the term of the light that has been scattered, but the, the component of the scattering in the forward direction is not taken off. It doesn't change direction, right? So this scattering cross-section, 1 over times the density, is of course giving you the length where the memory of the light at a given point in the sample is lost. You see? And if you have a lot of forward scattering, it's clear that it's not one scattering event that will sort of randomize the direction. It takes many scattering events, forward, 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 to turn by, by roughly 90 degrees. Okay? So uh, this thing is usually factors like 5 or 10 or so bigger than this thing. And this will be the important quantity in the following. All right. Now, on a larger scale than the individual particle scale and the wavelength scale, uh, you look at sort of the, tr the average transmission or reflection. <coughs> and if you have a slab system like the one I have sort of discussed here, with the thickness L much thicker than this transport mean free pass, then you're in this big, big optical turbidity case. I mean, in the really highly multiple scattering medium where the transmission is basically slow, small, and can be calculated by, say, a diffusion approximation or by simulations or so. And this was many times already on the, on the uh, this set in this meeting. It, it corresponds basically to Ohm's law in, in electronics that the transmission goes with 1 over L and the, the factor in front is the transport mean free pass. Okay, so the only two length scales in the game. And um, if you, and of course the reflectivity is of all the unity as long as you don't have, uh, let's say, uh, absorption and as long as this condition is fulfilled. Now, the reflectivity, which people call the albedo, is becoming smaller than unity. If you look at this table here or many other things that are not white, right? That is because some of the light has been in, inside this random wall type uh, journey in the sample has been absorbed. And this might be a spe spectral function, might depend, might depend on the wavelengths. You have a, um, in, in your blood, you have uh, red blood cells which preferentially absorb the blue light. That, that's why the outcoming light is red. And therefore, you have a sort of 
the color um, usually. And, but, but more importantly, the transmission then law changes from the 1 over L to an exponential decay, which is given by the absorption lengths uh, due to these sort of uh, chromophores or whatever you have absorbing particles, right? So, and um, another nice way to, a very accurate way actually to probe these systems is with time of flight. I mean, in optics, people of course have laser sources that are very, very short pulses like pico or even femtosecond pulses and then uh, which is much shorter than the, the typical time a light a photon would spend in a sample like this you must realize when I scatter a lot my this, the pass I'm, I'm sort of uh, going uh, being a photon is very long I mean here you see a, a typical scale for an experiment like this the time scale for the transiting through a sample which is above let's say a millimeter thick, is typically nanoseconds. Which means that the journey, even I mean, in, the, in the samples you will see later, it's like an aspirin. It's like a millimeter thick disk-like sample, and you shine in a picosecond pulse, and it takes nanoseconds to get out. Nanoseconds uh, correspond to the speed of light, corresponds to meters, typically meters. Right? So the journey of the light in a very thin sheet of highly striking material is much, much longer than the signal. So we are in a very, very heavy scattering regime where usually the light is scattered 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 times. As long as the mean free pass is short enough, meaning uh, micrometers, let's say. So still, what is yes. the delay zero? Sorry? What is the delay Here, this, this thing you talk, are you asking about? Yes, this is because, you know, Take the random walk diffusion picture, no okay. localization, it's nothing. Solvable. It's just diffusion here, yeah, right? It's just the solution of the diffusion equation. Then you, you step into this medium, you get scattered, and you break ex Experimentally, you are ballistic. Right? No, this is exponential down, you can see. So, it's so much down, because the sample is much thicker than the mean free pass. Okay. I told you that the, the direct part is 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 10, it's not detected. And then what is the linear term in your exponent? What? In your exponent, you have the diffusion curve, no, dans l'équation. Uh, yes, there is a linear term, V? This, yes. yes, this is due to absorption. I told you ah, here, okay. Okay. here the absorption, sorry, I was too quick. This is the absorption length. And of course, I was coming to discuss this. Um, you know, the long time decay here is sort of given by two terms. But one is phenomenological or what? what? The second term, is it phenomenological? No, no, no. When, when you take a, you, 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 in, instead of, uh, when you, you add to the scattering cross-section, you add an absorption cross-section, yeah, which yeah, counters the medium, okay. you get this, this is the long time solution of the diffusion equation once uh, all these fast modes have decayed, for example. And this is the last decaying mode due to the leakage of uh, the, the energy through the, the interfaces, that's this one. And then, of course, we have absorption, which then is exponential. If you are very far from an absorption line, then yes. this term is This is zero, and because the absorption length okay. gets infinity. Mm -hmm. oh, sure. And, uh, of course, the reason I'm saying this here is that uh, even the widest samples have absorption, and the absorption is typically, let's say, um, the absorption length might be meters, uh, while the um, scattering lengths of mean free pass might be micrometers. So, but, but it's measurable. And, and, and all these long time decays, you see, do see signatures of absorption in, in, in the experiment. OK. Now, um, and of course, here it, it takes some time, uh, no ballistic, but it, diffusive photons take some time to get through this distance L. And then you have this characteristic crossover where sort of most of the light gets out, uh, which characterizes maybe, or which, which uh, allows you to measure the diffusion constant, which is a combination of the effective speed and the mean free pass. I will not talk about all these dynamic experiments with the speed because of time constraints. Uh, let's, let's focus on that stuff. Anyway, and um, yes. So I'm sort of behind everybody else, but that looks like just exponential decay in time. Yes. But you have something which increases and decreases. Here? Yeah. This is basically exponential ra raising in time. It's a log scale, yeah? Yeah, and it's just not the... And then there's a crossover. 
Oh, oh, I see. So it's just that last part. That's that the last part, is the part with the error corresponds to this asymptotic yeah. last. Sorry. Yeah, I see. Sorry. So the first part, I, so what, what describes the first part? Well, it's sort of how the light at, at early times uh, gets out of the sample, and there's only very few photons that make it at very early times. And then there comes a, a time where the maximum amount of photons comes through. And then uh, photons that live longer in the sample than this are also exponentially sort of damped out, because when you do a random walk and you get to the surface, either this or this one, you leave. That, that kills you like absorption, basically. That's why these things should be out of All right. Good. Um, OK. Now, uh, at this point, you realize that the wave nature was totally ignored so far. It's just you know, diffusing intensity of photons, non-interfering photons, if you wish. And of course, uh, the story is more complicated because, in fact, you have sort of along these scattering paths, you have waves, and the waves go along different passes. And if you have a very long coherence length incident wave, let's say infinite coherence length wave, then all these waves that come out along the different passes will be able to interfere, and they will do give an interference pattern, which is very complicated. After all, it looks like this. It's this speckle pattern, which has been discussed many times already in this talk. And it's simply the, the, the signature of all this, let's say, randomness due to the pass length distribution. And you can say this is the pass length distribution because of the time uh, length distribution. Uh, and so you will set up a very random pattern where only rarely you have very high intensity and mostly you have sort of low intensity, which is dark and red here in this picture. And um, so if you take the electric fields in, in this situation, and sum them up and square them, then you get, of course, uh, this term here, which generates all the speckles, the interference between the different uh, passes i and j. While if you sort of average over speckles by, for instance, doing different samples, doing uh, somehow a configurational average, or you use a low coherence, you come to the point which was discussed before, which is only diffusing of intensities. Okay. All right. Now, um, there's a correction to that. Even if you do this averaging over configurations, you have that sort of uh, coherent backscattering interference. I mean, the interference between a given pass and its time reverse pass, which can never be averaged out. Because as you see from this little drawing, the face of the red guy and the, the black guy right in that backscattering direction is exactly the same, irrespective of the configuration of the pass. So even if you average over all these speckles, this coherent backscattering thing will survive. And uh, that was the uh, uh, sort of result of these studies at the time where we discussed this uh, sort of factor of two enhancement and the width, which is giving you a measure of L star. I will not go into the details of that. But it sort of turned out to be now a very practical way of measuring L stars, simply by measuring the width of these coins. Okay? But in addition, to connect to the localization stuff. Um, because this is scaling with KL star, um, as long as KL star is much bigger than one, it's a small perturbation. And physically, that means this is a very narrow cone. You have seen the one from Saturn earlier, uh, which is very, very narrow in angle. So it doesn't affect the, the major transport through the sample and transmission at all. I mean, a slight little bit. Right? And that. Uh, sort of comes into these models also when you when you do now the sort of whatever the technique uh, calculation of the transmission as a function of, of the thickness in this regime you find a correction which I think part you mentioned that uh, which is uh, to the Ohm's law which is scaling with one over case L star square and which is basically in this picture here just the amount of energy that goes into the backscatter because it's amplitude one and width scales, KL star in, in two dimensions. OK, so you see from this little thing that as long as KL star is huge, this is a small correction, and, and one doesn't really bother about it. And the interesting case is, of course, if this gets one, you have a regular criterion, then this the formula is, of course, getting nonsense. But we see the physics must change, right? So. Uh, 
in a sense, uh, the argument I've used here to look at waves outside the sample can also be uh, made inside the sample at any point. But you say I have a wave that is at this point generating a loop, I mean a wave uh, multiply scattered, and a part of it might come back here. And then I have the counterpart, the time reverse part, which does exactly the same thing then discussed here. So the probability of the wave classically or of the electron is higher to stay here than what it would be without this interference effect. Okay? So that is sort of giving rise to, uh, it's one mechanism to, to look at uh, when you, when you, at least the weak localization case, which tells you that the transmission must become smaller, the conductance must become smaller in a sample due to that effect compared to, the, uh, to ignoring this, right? Okay. Now, uh, I will not go into the scaling theory, of course, but uh, physically, maybe, one way of representing, Bart said there's many ways of looking at localization. <laughs> one of them is certainly that you do this little argument, you know, with these counter-propagating loops that interfere locally here. You can do it on a, on a primary loop. You can also do it at any other point with a certain probability. And then you generate daughter loops and uh, granddaughter loops and so on, and you see from that picture that the, the diffusion constant, if you take it dynamically, must depend on the distance somehow, or on the length scale, right? And Bach discussed this more in detail. But um, anyway, uh, I will, I think I will not go through it, but one, one has sort of the signature of the, the localization, the transmission turns it exponentially with the localization lengths, and this is hard to distinguish from the absorption, which does the same thing, even in a non-localized case. Okay. So we have spent some time in, in measuring these things and doing dynamic experiments, and so I will not go into this. But I, I mean, let's, let's focus rather on newer stuff, where we have tried now to sort of come up with samples that are better than these white paints. And in addition, uh, more well described in terms of microscopic scattering theory. I mean, this is a, uh, you can say, okay, I don't care, I just look what I can get in the market, uh, if I like the particles or so, and I put them in and I see what happens. That's what we and other people have done for many years. And then you come to the point, actually it's an interesting optics problem, which I mentioned in the beginning when I cited Anderson, that touching particles which are resonant knee scatters and which have sort of um, uh, very dense volume packings, uh, how is the light propagating in a system like this, irrespective of honest localization? So I'm focusing on, on this part now. Okay. Now, uh, and of course you don't, do not want to work with these ugly, let's say, commercial particles, which are not even spheres. They are titania, but they are ugly in shape and in, 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 in size. They're distributed. You want to study a well an academic case of, let's say, an ESD. And so uh, we came up with sort of uh, making ideal, more or less ideal spheres. You will see how ideal they are. And here's sort of an, an electron picture of some uh, polystyrene which you can buy. You don't have to synthesize it. People give you this for a couple hundred dollars uh, you know, in milligram amounts, right? So you just buy this and you, you, really, you, you, you concentrate them. And when you concentrate, you dry them, you put them in the, on the glass light, you let the water evaporate, and then what you find is, oops, they crystallize. And I will not go into the physics why hard spheres crystallize, but they do, right? And so this simply tells us that the, the sizes are pretty much the same of all the spheres, because if you had some distribution of sizes, they would never ever crystallize. Okay, so, and the same thing, this was, is not commercial and was made by, by uh, Ilona, basically, um, you know, titania particles using some synthesis recipes in the literature, you can op also make them so monodispersed that they do crystallize very nicely. Okay, so it's beautiful, you can make photonic crystal out of this, but this is not our story. We are not interested in all this system, in period for all the interest in more essentially maximally distant systems. All right. Now, how do we describe the scattering and the resonance in the scattering of these spheres? This is sort of first-class uh, optics stuff, right? Um, 
We have a sphere which has an index n particle su submit, uh, 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 sort of suspended in a medium n0, could be air or water or whatever. And then you have your incident wave that is characterized by the wave vector chi incident. And you look at a certain scattering angle I called theta s earlier, which defines the scattering vector ks. It's elastic scattering. So the length of these two vectors is the same. Or you can say that the momentum of the incident photon and the scattered photon have the same momentum, it's elastic scattering. And the, this geometry is characterized by this so-called scattering vector, which connects to the wavelengths and to the, the scattering angle this way. Now, as long as the indices of the two of the particle with respect to the environment is, is not they're not too different, if this is roughly unity, then this is a very small number. And then you can do a very easy approximation, which Newton and, and X-ray people use all the time, which is called the Rayleigh de Baigan's approximation. You calculate the intensity as a function of the angle of Q. And you find it's sort of a decaying function. Most of the light goes in forward direction, but then there's some points here where actually there's totally destructive interference and no light is scattered into these directions. And of course, the envelope is sort of strongly decaying. It's a log scale. You see, maybe not this is <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six decades, OK? Um, and um, so basically, the, if, if QR is small, then there's a lot of scattering. And then at larger values, it, it's scattering the case. Now, um, in, in these cases of the titania particles or polystyrene particles, this condition is not fulfilled. And you have to go and do me scattering, which is a formally quite complicated business. Uh, the result of, of this is that the interferences, the minima, where this is really intensely disappears, are washed out. And what you find is sort of still <coughs> overall roughly the same thing, but the minima are sort of smeared. And the polarization comes in. It's all technical. But doable. There are programs to calculate this. It's all under control. OK. Now, when you calculate with this me formalism, the scattering cross-section and the transport cross-section uh, as a function of the size now of the particles compared to the wavelengths, you see that the scattering is very inefficient at, at small particle sizes that you know from the blue sky. This is the lambda to the fourth blue sky law here. And then you get into this me resonance uh, regime <coughs> where the r and lambda are of order unity. And you have several mi resonances, and the cross section becomes much larger than the geometric cross section. P of pi are the particles square. on the left? The P S. What does that stand for? Polystyrene. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I had this on an earlier slide. Excuse me. All right. So this is uh, index 1.59, actually, polystyrene. And uh, of course, this thing depends on the index as well. I mean, the index is in the in the cross section, and Therefore, if you tune up the index, here this is titania in the rutile form, which has an index of 2.7 in air now, then you see these resonances are much sharper and also much higher. That's why one wants to, one wants maximum turbidity, one wants to work with titania rather than with polystyrene. Okay? All right, and of course, one wants to sit at one of these resonances. And then earlier, attempts to maximize turbidity. And so we're all using this. I mean, people were looking here and there and there. And I will tell you in a minute that this is no good because of all these correlation points. OK. Anyway, so we have a, for, for individual particles, we have a total control of what should happen in terms of scattering efficiency. Now, uh, we are not in, in, in individual particles. We have a dense system where particles are very close to each other. So the, the, the scattering of this particle J will be affected by the scattering of all these other particles. They're sitting nearby. And you cannot say this is a, a, a homogeneous medium of index N0. Uh, you wouldn't even know the index, how to define the index of the environment if you wanted to do it. But in fact, you can't do it, right? But the first approach to sort of, which is also, also quite old, um, was to say, all right, we take just the interferences between this guy and all the neighborhoods. And as long as um, the distances between R and J uh, are random, 
it doesn't matter. Every, everything averages out in the, in the wave, sort of uh, averaging over many configurations. But uh, no, they are not. The distances cannot be random because the particles are hard spheres and they cannot interpenetrate. They have, of course, there is a shell like structure which is parameterized by this per position per correlation function, which I didn't want to show you, but it's sort of an oscillating function where around this given particle you have a shell with maximum probability of finding another one, then you have a, a, a hole and another shell and so on. Right? And that gives rise, if you fully transform basically this G of R, you, you, this quantity S of Q, which we call the structure factor, tells you uh, what the scattering, the angular dependent scattering looks like due to these correlations. Structure factor. It's well known in, in atomic physics as well. And here I give you examples for hard spheres. Uh, this is how the structure factor would look like for hard spheres at 10% at volume fraction, it oscillates a little bit, and at 45% volume fraction, it oscillates a lot more. Okay, so this is not, um, and, and the total intensity is now, the angular dependent intensity is now the form factor of the individual particle scattering I've introduced before times the structure factor. Right, because those are sort of convoluted things. You can. And here you have an ex a specific example again for polystyrene beads. This hardcore structure factor and the form factor, and we see, and you have to do this integration I showed before on, on these functions. And when you do that, so you, you calculate this formula with, with all these expressions inserted, you find that at the mean free pass you calculate, sigma star is connected to the mean free pass, like here, um, you find that here's 1 over L star plotted versus the volume fraction that for low volume fraction it, it simply follows this sort of idealized uh, situation of non-interacting, non-correlated particles before, and then it deviates. And when you come to 40%, even in the case of polystyrene, you're using this formula with the non-correlated, no structure factor, would give you essentially the wrong result. Okay? So the bad news is these correlations weaken the scattering. You see, I mean, this is one over the, uh, over the mean free pass, which is the turbidity. Turbidity sort of saturates with respect to this. And even worse, you know, take it further. I mean, th th this approach breaks, of course, down when you go to very high parking fractions because you can't park spheres above 74% anyway, right? But even before th this approach will break down, and you will see reasons why later. And, but at 100%, I mean, you can't do 100% with spheres, but if you would take cubes and the corresponding structure factor of cubes, which is, of course, available, then you would have a packing of, of, of cubes, which is a homogeneous, dense packing of homogeneous cubes, which is a dense medium, which doesn't scatter at all. So you must end up at 100% at zero here again. And the, the big question is, how does this happen? And if I play with the parameters, how can I eventually tune this maximum up to get close to the organization or something. Right. Okay. Now, here's an example for Titania with the same model, which is also an old uh, slide, uh, where L star is now plotted with correlations and without correlations. And you see the correlations at, at, for this size here and this volume fraction. So they get dramatically annoying, let's say, uh, in, in, the in the visible regime where uh, sort of you lose a lot of scattering power, and this is the offer criterion which we hoped at the time to, to hit here, but due to the correlations we are waiting. So this is only theory. Sorry? This is only theory. Yeah, that's the same theory, it's all the same. No, no, it means there is no experimental data on this problem. On this slide? No, no, it's just the calculation. I'm just trying to tell you that uh, it's sort of why it's hard and, and how hard it is. Okay. All right. Now, um, and there's even more complications, which are more recent. Um, you realize that a Mie scatter is sort of a resonator, and when you take the electromagnetic field distribution inside and outside this resonator, you will see that it has sort of near field components, which do not propagate to the far field. We have talked about the far field so far in all these models, meaning the field far away on the detector. But when you have now this sphere, 
which is near field, which cannot propagate, but the next sphere gets close to it and touches into this near field, you get, of course, strong, let's say, resonant coupling between the two. It's like uh, antennas that are sort of closer than the wavelengths, radio antennas, they couple strongly. And this will affect the, the scattering properties a lot. And there was a paper here by um, these people, uh, Fabario was a, a leading author, uh, and um, it, it sort of has, has a little model that shows that the near field scattering model it gives different results than our this collective model is what we talked <coughs> before. Okay, so, and um, even worse, there is sort of other contributions. In the multiple scattering, you get what, what people call recurrent scattering. I mean, once you scatter off, let's say, this particle to here, eventually um, this particle scatters back to here, irrespective of the near field effect, even if it's far away. And then you set up sort of um, complicated combinations of, of sort of near field, uh, well, recurrently scattered uh, light, which is not taken into all these pictures so far. Okay? And uh, that was pointed out already in 95. And all right, now, um, and in addition, you have what Sergei uh, is discussing since a couple of years, that the vector nature itself, all this, what I told you before, was basically scalar waves. I mean, it was not scalar waves in the new calculation, but it can be taken as scalar waves as long as you do not include depolarization. But here, um, as Sergei have sort of shown that, for, at least for ray, for point-like particles, the polarized nature sort of seems to destroy localization. So one has to actually worry about the propagation of the, of the polarization in this multiple scattering medium a lot. So you see, uh, all these things are complicated. And what I'm trying to tell you in the next couple of minutes is um, how one can sort of uh, try to come up with a model that takes all these things into account. All right. And uh, this was basically done by Beaufort. And uh, the work was inspired by this early paper by Kurt Busch and, and Sukulis, um, who sort of, um, instead of describing the, me the multiple scattering, as I have done before, as a sequence of, of individual scattering events, they have a following uh, relatively elegant argument. Take one particle that sits here and has a dielectric constant epsilon particle here, and it's embedded in a sort of uh, s uh, virtual sphere, which has another dielectric constant, epsilon m. And then outside, you have an effective medium. You don't treat the scattering on longer length scales. You just say outside, I have an effective medium, which has another effective index. And uh, so this is already a crude approximation of, of, of this thing. but. Uh, the, the physical idea driving this is that now you argue the energy density and this thing here should be the same than the energy density, the average energy density in the medium, right? So I, I have sort of the picture that irrespective of what the particles does, the energy density in this sphere should be the same than the energy density in this sphere when this sphere has a radius which is roughly given by the average distance between the particles. F is the volume fraction of the particles, right? And when you do this, at least you do not um, violate energy conservation. Okay, it looks a bit uh, strange because you lose a lot of information on the angular dependent scattering stuff, but at least you, the, the trade-off is maybe you conserve energy. All right, now you can put this quantitatively in. You use the same formulas for this transport cross-section and so on. This is the volume fraction. And you calculate with this assumption in, or this constraint in addition, you calculate now the effective index as a function of all the other parameters. And you can do. And here's the result. And up show, here I show you the scattering cross-section as shown before, just as a re reference uh, for uh, in isolated mesphere. And now here you have sort of the color code is the, the result of these calculations for a given example, polystyrene in air, as a function of the particle size, normalized to the wavelengths, and as a function of the filling fraction. And here you have the static, the scattering strength 1 over L star. 
and here you have the effective index which goes with it. And you see at low volume fractions, there's not much difference from, from here, but as you go up in volume fraction, these lines, so these resonances come up more pronounced, but they shift. And at the same time, the index of the effective index of refraction gets really strong oscillations. They're not physical, don't, right? They're not, it's just in this model, in order to make it all self-resistant and energy conserving, you, you require uh, an effective index of this, all right? And now, uh, Geoffroy has compared this to direct Tmax, T matrix uh, calculations for a couple of thousand particles uh, to check, so basically, uh, and by solving Maxwell's equation numerically. And um, uh, well, the result of this is this is a busy slide. Um, we, we check the ECPA model with respect to other models and see what the differences are. And the, the sort of bad news is there are huge differences. The models are not very similar. I mean, let me guide you through this slide. This is the, the me, isolated me case, a gray line like before. The red line are these um, ECPA calculations, again, as a function of the size parameter, one over L star. And these dashed guys are these numerical results for different uh, clusters of particles and so on. I skip the details. And the main message is, and this is the brute force calculation for, for the um, for this thing here. And you see all of them have resonances, but the positions of the resonances are not the same, and the amplitudes are not the same, and the values after all are not the same. Okay. So one way to decide what, what is sort of good and bad, bad models is of course compared to the experiment. So here we come back to our particles. Um, polystyrene particles, I told you already, they are beautiful, they crystallize. But we do not want crystals, so we want a white crystal. And the way we do this is by sedimenting a dilute suspension so that the particles rain down to the floor, let's say. And while they do this, we sort of enforce aggregation. And how can we do this? It's called chemistry, and I, I realize you're not a really chemist, but one way is the particles are sort of electrostatically stabilized, so usually they, when they touch, they can get off because Coulomb repulsion is strong. Now if you add salt, you screen the Coulomb uh, repulsion and you uh, enforce Van der Waals attraction, let's say. And in the very end, they will sort of stick together uh, more easily. And if you do this as a function of salt, you see, indeed, um, at higher salt concentrations, you do not get crystals because before they can crystallize, which takes some time, they stick, okay, in, in a random fashion. And, well, not ideally, here you have a larger zoom, uh, and you see there's still some little crystallites here, and this is sort of amorphous, but if you go high enough in the salt concentration and the conditions, you, you get sort of a random thing, which we call a colloid glass. There's no uh, periodic order visible in this. It looks like there are correlations. There are strong correlations necessarily because, I mean, like in the fluid I described before, because spheres cannot interpenetrate. But it is typical, if you look at the structure factors from this, it looks like a, like a normal class, so atomic what, class. What is the order of correlations? Sorry? What is the order the of correlations? The range, you mean? Yes. Um, a few particles. I mean, like hard spheres. The, 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 the structure factors of hard spheres I showed you is basically one or two shells of particles that are correlated, and then the correlation. The that criteria in the glass physics community, how to uh, say it's a real glass and, uh, or a correlated glass, and so this is more or less an ideal glass. All right. Now for the titania, the same. I mean, we can sort of use this salt trick to get random packing. And in the titania case, well, the synthesis was made with different recipes, which is cooking, and we're not going to this. You can control the radius of these monodispersed spheres over a certain range. Uh, you can sort of play with the polydispersity. I mean, if you have a narrow size distribution, like in this sample, it will crystallize. Here's the size distribution. And if you change parameters, you get the polydispersed sample with larger and bigger guys mixed together, which is this distribution here. And so we can actually compare 
all these systems. And another problem in all this is how to make a macroscopic sample out of it that is sort of homogeneous. I mean, in the end, I want a pellet, which is a sample, a macroscopic sample like this here, millimeter size or centimeter size, which is really crack free. Let's say, you know, when you dry stuff, usually you get cracks. And we spend quite some time avoiding cracks, and here's the result. So, this is sort of set, typical samples. And the way we do this is by adding a small amount of polymer, which makes a network. It's maybe hard to see. And maybe I have another, yes, here. Um, when you zoom in, you see that this polymer sort of sets up uh, somehow an elastic network which prevents ruptures, microscopic cracks, so these some samples of cracks. And another thing one can vary is the index of refraction. I mean, I showed you always polystyrene, 1.6. The amorphous titania happens to have an index of 2.0, but uh, so that there are two other crystal forms of titania possible. The one is called anatase, which has 2.5, and another phase, which is called rutile crystalline structure, has an index of 2.7. And by heating the system, you can go from basically from amorphous to anatase to rutile in the preparation. And it can be controlled by X-ray scattering and uh, so on. So we have sort of, let's say, at least four, four values of refractive index, which we can use in the experiments. Now, well, we compare this with our old ADWI uh, thing, and now I show you a few data. And I'm not sure how time is going on, but there. Uh, oh, I still have five minutes. We, at five minutes? That's a little. OK, then I will skip how we measure a star. This is sort of coherent backscattering set up to fit, fit with, with some formulas of the backscattering cone shape. Uh, and we sort of, um, for wide angles, we have to use another setup where we sort of illuminate the sample through a little hole and have lots of diodes here so that we can measure basically wide angles here. And as a result of this, we get a star. Okay, now I'm showing you 1 over L star versus size over lambda for different samples with different radia and different colors here. And each time we scan the wavelengths over a certain range in the visible. And all these data compile together and give you these data here. This is not our own data. This are data by Diederik Wiersma and company on, on somewhat larger particles. And the message is uh, you do see this is the ECPA calculation, the gray here, uh, which sort of hits all the resonances OK. And even at this part here, the amplitude's OK. So we come up with, you know, this is no fitting parameter at all. So this looks actually, you know, so promising. And of course, the check is if you use just chalk, I mean something which is not a homogeneous particle size, then you get some intermediate values like here. And titania compared to polystyrene, here's the data of polystyrene again. And amorphous titania gives this, and anatas gives this. So you can see that the resonances shift, and they sort of, the mean free pass gets smaller as you crank up the index. So that's also nice. Again, the ECPA works without fitting parameters. And here's a check of the polydispersity effect, which of course screws up the resonances. You don't have a homogeneous particle size of resonances spit out. And indeed, this is the data for the polydispersed samples compared to the small polydispersity sample, which has its resonances at the right place. So we think this is a pretty nice model. Unfortunately, um, it's still not big enough scattering to hit the you know, really criteria. And of course, we have checked, and we will not talk about this in detail, but none of these samples show any sign of localization whatsoever with, with these kind of light experiments. OK. Anyway, now let me, um, I will actually, in the sake of time, skip the conclusions of that part, because I wanted to tell you a little bit about this 1D sample, which is nice and very recent stuff, and I think it's sort of maybe even conceptually more exciting than just messing around with materials. So I told you uh, the Faraday rotation breaks time reversal symmetry. This was already known to Faraday himself and to Rede. Rede invented sort of a spy mirror, uh, which is the following thing. I mean, take a, a sheet of glass, which is not shown here, between one person and the other person. 
and then you put this in a magnetic field which goes from the one person to the other person, right? And you, the Faraday rotation means that the linear polarized light, when it propagates along the magnetic field, will rotate. Now, when you put a mirror here and you come back, it will not rotate back because now you are not propagating parallel to the field but anti-parallel to the field, it will continue to rotate. So when you come with this 40, let's say you adjust parameters such that the rotation is 45 degrees and you put the polarizer linear at 45 here, then transmission is 100% is, is ideally and they see each other, right? But now if you go back and it rotates in the same field, of course, 2 times 45 is 90 to the perpendicular polarization. This is blocked here. So this guy can see the other guy, but this guy cannot. And this is, of course, used uh, for uh, as a light diode or a spy mirror or so. And um, we have at the time shown that this also breaks the uh, coherent back scanning column, which is relies on this tiny because symmetry of the two passes, as I explained before. So the, in a strong magnetic field, the coherent backscattering cone sort of disappears, and this was stuff that is already quite old. Now, this is very far from localization, and we wanted to see what is the contribution to localization of this reciprocal breaking uh, stuff, and therefore, we uh, sort of uh, came with the, to, the, to the very well-known and studied case of, let's say, one-dimensional localization, which is experimentally realized here by a set of glass plates. And the disorder is made by making the thickness of the different glass plates a bit different. I mean, Asi has talked about this already. The, the bit means this delta L, sorry, oops, the delta L is bigger than the wavelengths, but still quite small compared to the macroscopic thickness, which is uh, a few hundred microns or a million microns, right? And now um, these people have actually were the first to do these experiments, and they showed both theoretically and experimentally that the transmission decays exponentially, the average transmission, and there's a localization length here, which is just given by the reflectivity or the transmittivity of a given slide, which is calculated here from Fresnel's law at normal instance. So that's easy. And, but in addition, there are strong fluctuations. Of course, Arsi pointed this out. And the fluctuations are to be seen as a function of the configuration. For a given set of positions, of course, you have one transmission. But now you do another sample with you know, putting in place slightly different positions, you get another transmission. And you set up, you do this a thousand times, you set up uh, sort of a, a transmission fluctuations, right? And this is the idealized case. Now, in the real uh, experiment, as you also talked about this, um, you cannot stay 1D forever, unfortunately. I mean, I'm sorry, I should have said what is actually giving rise to all this is the interference. I mean, the primary beam gets in here. Part of it gets reflected, let's say, at this point, and it goes back here. Then it gets reflected here, and it sort of part of the wave is bouncing back and forth many, many times, and of course, they recuperate phase shifts, the huge phase shifts when you do this, right? So that in the end, when you sum up all the, the wave here, you have actually something like a speckle pattern as a function of the configuration, of course, right? Now, when you do this with non-ideally parallelized slides, parallel slides, then of course, your reflection will kick out the light a little bit out of this primary direction. So you end up with zigzag stuff, which sort of populates different angles at the output. So the more slides you put in, the thicker your beam will be, the more divergent your beam will be. So you're losing the one decent. And of course, this is annoying because you, you're not working with one D, but with sort of quasi one D or universe. Now, um, I will skip the details of this as well. One can do transfer matrix simulations for this case where you sort of define the incident and the outgoing fields and you define a transfer matrix and the transfer matrix has a propagating, wave propagating part and has a reflectivity part and then you come up with the transfer matrix of one slide which has two reflecting surfaces plus the propagating medium in the middle and then you add the parallel. 
right? Far day rotation brings in now different indices for left and right polarized lines, which is different than this and this. I mean, this N2 has two components, right? For circular left and circular right. And then you have to integrate it into your formalism this way, okay? So it, N plus is sort of right-handed and N minus is the <coughs> left-handed index. All right. Now, we, we go with this model, you know, you simulate this very easily, let's say, uh, and you find that the log of the transmission versus the number of the blades, uh, so the average transmission decays exponentially as expected, and this is sort of giving you the localization, which is in this case, I think, six or six point something, right? Blades, units of blades. And this is sort of the blue line without magnetic field. Now you put on the magnetic field, uh, you see that this, this, this slope here, the yellow slope, dashed slope, is sort of uh, measuring the unpolarized or non-detected polarization transmission. Here, the slope is smaller. Not much, 11%. OK, a small uh, contribution to the reciprocity breaking, but it's not a factor of two. It's not a big thing. It's 11 we were puzzled by this. In addition, you have at small blade numbers, you have these oscillations, which are due to the fact that in a given blade, you rotate by 45 degrees. So that's the setup in 18 Tesla in the big view. And then you sort of rotate many times around. And if you detect polarization, of course, you get oscillations first. And why do they disappear at, at higher uh, sort of uh, blade numbers? Uh, will be explained in a second. The same. Uh, for fluctuations, you measure the variance of the normalized transmission. It, increase, it, it oscillates in the polarization detected case, but it sort of um, increases a lot as a function of plate number, but it saturates somehow. This is ideal simulations, all simulations. Now, uh, I apologize, I had a video, but it doesn't run on this computer, but, so I have to do it by hand. What is, because we, we took a while to understand, but we finally understood what happens. Um, this is Poincaré sphere. I mean, it's nice to talk about this in Poincaré, in the Institute Poincaré. Who, who does not know what a Poincaré sphere is? <laughs> you all know what a Poincaré sphere is, okay. Poincaré sphere is sort of is a way of representing polarizations of light. At the poles, you have right-handed and left-handed polarization, circular polarization. At the equator, you have linear, pol linear polarizations, where, of course, the, this angle describes the angle of the vector of the polarization. And all these intermediate things are elliptically polarized state. Now, we start with linear polarization in our experiment in x direction. And after one plate, you find that it has rotated by 45 degrees. No wonder. I mean, this is sort of uh, due to the Faraday effect, which was set that way. And it has slightly been spoiled. Now, you do two plates, you find it's oh, roughly 90 degrees linear, still linear, but spoiled. I mean, there is elliptical components already. And you do five plates, it's even more spoiled. Uh, and at 30 plates, it sort of takes almost all the Poincaré sphere. So why is this? I mean, the, why you sort of rotate in the plates, in every plate, at every plate, you have a reflection of a part of it, which goes back and accumulates further rotations and further phase shifts. So the light doesn't stay linearly polarized at all, because all these phase shifts give you, give you elliptical contributions. And then the polarization spreads and spreads and spreads. And we saw in the beginning, OK, if you would do 100 plates and very strong magnetic fields, this will be totally screwed up. It's not. Unfortunately, my video shows it much more clearly, but, but here you can see it already that there's more states on the poles than in the middle, right? Even at 30 plates and 18 Tesla. And that means the light at the end is circularly polarized, either right polarized or left polarized, and it stays there. Why does it stay there? Because once it's circularly polarized, it doesn't couple to the Faraday, to the magnetic field any longer, because the Faraday effect is sort of the by circular by the fringes. So it, if the light only feels that the plus polarization circular index, it doesn't see the, the minus index. And it can't change anymore. And that's why, unfortunately, the coupling of the magnetic field sort of is saturating. Once the polarization is here or there, the game is over. Right? 
<laughs> well, all right. Now, this is my videos which don't work. Here's a setup with how we measure this. I will show you, after all, a few measurements. Uh, and here is what you, when you look with a CCD camera, here back, uh, what has been transmitted through the slides, you see at, at zero slides, you see the primary beam. There's a little bit of interference due to the camera plate in front of it. The, the plate in front of the camera, so it fringes. Okay, but when you go higher plate numbers, you see that the, the picture becomes more and more spectral. And that is exactly what I said. You have this transition from the ideal 1D case, which would be maybe this, right, to the speckle case where the light has accumulated angles, different angles, and by that has accumulated different passes, different phases, and that's why it becomes speckle. So we are limited in these experimental um, observations at, at high plate numbers by the appearance by transition, sort of smooth transition into quasi 1D configuration, which is speckly, let's say. And still you can do statistics of these speckles and everything, uh, and briefly because I have to finish. Um, the average transmission, the average transmission very well is, is almost essential, identical to the simulations. I mean, the, the faint lines are simulations, and the blue lines and the, the, the dots are the exper experiments. And you see at small n, it works very well, no fitting parameters, nothing. And at large l, you get some deviation due to this quasi 1D spoiling, which I explained before. And um, the histograms of the, the statistics of this sort of uh, is very narrow. In the primary beam, it's basically uh, one intensity, a little bit smeared by the experimental, by these fringes I've shown you. But when you go to higher number of plates here, it becomes more and more speckle-like. I mean, a speckle would have an exponential statistics, meaning a straight line in this plot. And eventually, there's some deviation up here. We're not sure whether that's still a signature of localization in the experiment. And uh, again, uh, these intensity fluctuations, they saturate because of this 1D, quasi 1D crossover. And well, that brings me basically to the end. That's the last slide. Uh, comparison between the simulation and the experiments in terms of statistics. Here are zero field cases for 6, 8, 20, and 30 plates. Of course, in the simulations, you pick up these long time tails or these long high intensity tails, let's say, in the, in the distribution due to the local 1D localization, as RC explained in detail. And um, the experiments cannot show this because at this part here, they sort of um, uh, are spoiled by the quasi 1D behavior. And while in the magnetic field, at, at low plate numbers, the agreement is even much better and becomes, of course, worse again at high uh, uh, sort of plate numbers. All right, so that was all. And I think instead of wrapping this up, I stop here and thank you for your patience. Thank you.
but for paints. Yeah. You know, you can make paints which are 100 nanometers thick, but I mean lightweight, everything will reflect on. I mean, this is perfect, right? And then this guy, Dempoil, I mean, some of you know, he's an optics guy, and you know, he's written books about optics, and so, you know, well, I mean, that's fine, but you will never get there anyhow. <laughs> so, because there is, I mean, we have all kinds of problems. Uh, you have right. We have recurrent scattering. You have correlated scattering. You have uh, uh, near field effects. And but then, of course, you have millions of ways to explain why the parallel theorem is difficult to achieve. But we know that for acoustic, for elastic waves, you have all the things, you know? Yes. And, and, still, and it works. And for me, I, right now, I have many discussions also with Sergei, who's doing simulations. And in simulations, he's seeing the same thing. And it's, for me, it's completely critical. I don't understand. Because all the arguments that Bjork was saying, they all apply. And they all work against you most of the time. But uh, for elastic waves, apparently, it's, you know, you can manage it. And for Maxwell, this is what I was mentioning in this meeting. Index is much higher in acoustics. And he, the other material is a higher index itself, yeah. but they're not the electric self absorbing. And then you get two by absorbing. I mean, metal particles will, will do the job, but they're absorbing too much. So it's sort of maybe the nature of sort of the index of an optical frequency yeah. which kills it for the light. Yeah, I can't have the same Because we have to have the next slide. Uh, I just had a quick comment because uh, actually I mean, uh, everybody is uh, talking about light localization and, and uh, citing Sergei's paper, but Sergei's paper, uh, the claim is only for, uh, uh, you will tell me better than me, but it's only for point scatter in the, uh, randomly placed in the random space. And if you, and now there are some new numerical simulation from uh, Frank Schaeffel in uh, Primo who shows that you can get uh, signs of Anderson localization in, uh, in a structure which does not look at all like that. This structure is more like a network uh, of uh, I mean, connected network, uh, I don't yes. know, like spider net if you want, a 3D spider net. And uh, if you uh, take the index of correction of uh, silicon, which is 3.6 or something, like then you get signs of Anderson localization of light. So it's not, I mean, you can. Well, this was just a good point. Maybe it's, it's brand new. I mean, it's, it was just it was, uh, uh, posted an archive a few weeks ago, so it's really effective. Okay. So, you know what I'm going to talk about at lunch. <laughs>